I said high index of suspicion is important. So when can we you know suspect? So we have some of the notorious drugs or we say most common drugs which are likely to produce adverse drug reaction. So if there is an antibiotic, analgesic, diuretics, cardiovascular drugs, or sedative hypnotics, this is the most probable drug. So if patient has received any of the drugs and something has occurred which is you know, unanticipated or untoward reaction, you can suspect, you know, you can suspect. Then we should know who are most susceptible. Mainly people who are seriously ill because they will be receiving multiple medications, the polypharmacy, females, people with renal and liver disorder because the metabolism and the excretion is affected, HIV infections where a lot of you know, multidrug therapy, drug interactions happening and drugs itself are notorious to cause adverse effects and uh, alcoholism. So as I said, the suspicion becomes very important. So when do we, you know, suspect if there is some rashes, itching, shortness of breath, hypotension, arrhythmia, or convulsion, anaphylaxis, anything you can suspect. But the drawback is that ADS are great mimickers. You don't know whether it is a disease or a, you know, because the disease issues or is it because of the drug. Then you go for a, you know, confirmation. How do you confirm? Most of the time with the clinical judgment you can do, but it's a little difficult. Then what do you do? You need to take history of all the drug intake. You need to ask the previous drug exposure and reaction. Most of the time, this is where, uh, you know, one thing, people, if you ask them, some of them do uh, give a information. I had some drug taken, you know, some reaction was there. Detailed examination, signs of serious ADRs, and if there is a possibility, correlate with the clinical laboratory data. So ultimately, the last point for the confirmation is a causality assessment. Yes, it may be difficult for you to do at that time. Not a problem. Just report it. The experts will do it. The ANC center people who are involved in the activity will do it. If they forward it, NCC will do it. But start reporting. That is the main thing. And if you come across an adverse reaction, what are you going to do? Stop the drug. Stop the drug if it's really required. Substitute an alternate. But don't forget to monitor for a further reaction. And as all of you know, if there is a hypersensitivity reaction, please start the management with the epinephrine, antihistamines, or corticosteroids. So always, it is better to take preventive steps. How do you take a preventive steps? Medication history has to be taken properly. And if you are giving some of the highly, you know, most common drugs which are notorious to cause adverse drug reactions, like an antibiotic or an analgesic, educate the patient about the warning signs. And if you're giving especially the you know, injectables or something, check the quality of the drug administration before the administration, especially in case of even vaccines. Okay, withhold the drug and report to the concerned authority. If there is some reaction, please withhold the drug and report it. That is important. So points to remember, always the safety is a first. So early recognition of an ADR is very vital. For that, high index of suspicion is needed. And once you suspect and you know it is recognized please stop the engagement and see if there is any alternate etiology if not try to investigate the cause and if a patient develops an exacerbation of a condition there may be possibility of the drug also so with that uh, thought in mind you will have to you know look into the drug history and analyze what it is so understanding the pharmacology of the drug is key for prevention you know how the drug acts you know what are the drugs possible to produce a side effect you can you know attribute or collaborate uh, you know uh, at least related to what has happened so to conclude an effective reporting system is the corner store for a safe practice so reporting can help to identify the risk and provide the information about the causes this can help to reduce the likelihood of the injury to the patients so as we always say, prevention is better than the cure. So be watchful. Report all ADRs irrespective of the severity. That is, a, uh, you know, that is what we require and that is a take-home message. Please report irrespective of it, uh, its severity. No problem. In the beginnings, it is important to do it. Mm -hmm. So there is no, as once the Harold uh, Kamensky said, there are no really safe biologically active drugs. There are only safe physicians. So as a physicians or as a healthcare professionals, we have to join our hands to save the world. And that is important for a patient safety. So let us all join hands with 
PVPI to ensure the patient safety. And I would like to give acknowledgement for the organizing committee for giving me an opportunity and Dr. Sachitanand Adiga, Professor in Department of Pharmacology for all his help and guidance for helping me out with this presentation. So thank you all. So people who are vigilant do not die, but people who are negligent are as if they are dead, as one Siddha said. So keep that in mind, be active, be vigilant, try to help out how much you can do, either in reporting or in creating awareness to the public. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am, for that enlightening session. We will now open the floor for discussion. Attendees can unmute to ask queries or put them in the chat box. I hope at least uh, the students have understood something. post lesson session, I don't know how interactive it was. At least they've got a gist of what is their responsibility. Yes, but they, it was uh, elaborate one and uh, obviously it is very clear and they must have understood it very well. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah, I think if we can take up the questions in the end also, Okay, my God. okay, no problem. Yeah, Ananya, we can move on. Thank you, Swati. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So um, now moving on to our next speaker, Dr. Rowan Vincent, expert safety physician at Merck, will be speaking on the topic vaccine pharmacovigilance. Welcome, sir. I request Dr. Navya Shriyar, Assistant Professor, Department of Pharmacology, in Apoya Medical College to introduce our speaker. Yeah, hello, everyone. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Rovin Vincent. Uh, Dr. Rovin has received his medical degree from Vaidehi Institute of Medical Science, Bangalore, and his master's in pharmacology from Father Muller's Medical College, Bangalore. So earlier, he has worked in IQIA, which was a uh, Quintiles earlier as senior medical safety officer, and currently he is working as expert safety physician at Merck, where he performs medical assessments of ICSRs. So, Dr. Roman will now give us an interesting talk and on vaccine pharmacovigilance, which is a topic of current relevance. Over to you. Sir. Hello, hi. Uh, so let me. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, so now the current, uh, can you see my presentation? Yeah, is um, vaccines, you know, vaccines are the current trending uh, thing. So as you all know, it's like a significant public health intervention, which has the potential to save a lot of lives. So it's one of the, uh, uh, the recent century's best uh, public health intervention that has happened. So as you see here, um, you know, the, the incidence rates of the disease is coming down as the vaccination rates have improved. So uh, this is a landmark day in the history of uh, medicine, like uh, when smallpox was eradicated uh, from the world. But then, but then uh, we also have a few uh, adverse effects that can happen, possibly happen. So that's why we need pharma vaccine pharmacovigilance. Uh, I'm audible, right? Yeah. So I hope uh, I'm audible and my screen is visible. So this is the definition of, uh, and thank you, Sw uh, Dr. Swati, for that introduction. Uh, so the science and activities relating to the detection, assessment, understanding, and communication of any adverse event following immunization, and also prevention of any untoward effects. 
So we have a lot of series of activities that happen in vigilance, which I'll take you through. So ultimately here, our uh, goal is you know, to improve the benefit. So when we talk about benefit, the benefit is not only to that individual, but also to the whole community. Uh, so here we have a dual uh, benefits. And, and, and then the risk here, uh, see, uh, medicines and all are given to patients, like sick patients, but then here we are giving a vaccine to a healthy individual. So we need to take that. And then if an adverse event happens, it's a little um, unfortunate. So that's why we need to take that into account while uh, doing the benefit risk evaluation of vaccines. As Dr. Swati told, uh, which I liked very much, like uh, safety works when people work together. So for vaccine pharmacovigilance, we have who are the stakeholders, the manufacturers, the biopharmaceutical industry, the healthcare providers, the people on uh, whom uh, vaccines are administered, the uh, uh, academics and research people, regulatory authorities. So everyone, everyone is involved uh, in vaccination. So if everyone works together, it's uh, more beneficial. So now coming to the technical um, the adverse event following immunization. So any adverse event, right? Um, so I take a vaccine and then come home. On the way home, I just uh, slip down and fall down. Even that is an adverse event. Need not have to be a, they, they need not have to be a causal association uh, with the vaccination. So anything that happens following a immunization vaccination is an AEFR. It could be just a symptom, a sign, a laboratory, a simple laboratory finding or a disease. But now, as I told you, it's a coincidental event. It can be, it, there are various types of it. So one could be just a coincidental event. So a fever develops. But then the fever turns out to be malaria. So it is not ca uh, causally associated with the vaccine. It could be just because of an anxiety associated with the uh, immunization, syncope that happens. So this again is not causally associated to the vaccine, but it's still an AEFI, which has to, which uh, is, has, it's better if it's reported. And then immunization errors, uh, like because of this cold storage, uh, handling storage, handling, administration, all, uh, so the healthcare workers uh, uh, need to be educated how to handle uh, vaccines. Many times vaccines are, are given not in healthcare facilities, but in schools and other uh, uh, centers. So we need to educate all of them because this is a completely a preventable uh, uh, reaction uh, by education. So here now, next, this is uh, from here on, fourth and fifth uh, subtypes are actual reactions an adverse reaction, so where there is a causal association. So here what happens because of the quality defects, uh, the manufacturers, uh, uh, because of some quality issues, so, uh, vaccines are biological products. So the manufacturing process varies from, uh, depending on the uh, 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 systems used in, uh, so there, there can be a product quality defects. So, uh, there, so that, that's why we have this good manufacturing practices in place so that there are absolutely no quality defects. And then actual, uh, reaction because of uh, properties which are inherent to the vaccine. Example, we have a limb swelling that happens following a D uh, DTP vaccination. So these are the five uh, types of AEFI, out of which the fourth and fifth are adverse reaction, rest all are adverse events. Uh, so never nevertheless, everything is reported. We never know a coincidental event. Uh, when we see like multiple cases of coincidental event, it can actually be you know, by doing this aggregate report, we might uh, uh, actually come to a conclusion that it was causally associated. So submission, how do we submit uh, as uh, we uh, now in a uh, ADR center? So we have this a AEFI forms, which can be uh, filled up and submitted to the centers. We have the apps, we have um, the toll free numbers. Also, you can also uh, if you want to uh, publish articles. So routinely we scan for articles to see if there are any adverse events. So now coming to, uh, uh, moving on to the ICSR. So once you, you submit a, a report, what happens after that? So uh, many of you, some of you would have submitted. So we, like, we never know what happens. So I've been working in this sector, so I can take you through. It's, it's called a, each report is an ICSR. It's uh, all the events that happen to a particular patient at a particular point of time is called an ICSR. It is digitally, uh, we have a digital software for it, uh, technology, and uh, uh, we can, uh, it's submitted electronically. So we have, uh, uh, how do we get ICSR spontaneous as everyone, uh, everyone reports spontaneously like uh, uh, through these uh, forms and uh, uh, the apps. 
we also have an organized way of collecting data through clinical trials, registries, and uh, uh, patient support programs, and where uh, the manufacturers and the market authorization holders will try to get data uh, in a very systematic way. So what happens with spontaneous many times is like the data is incomplete. Uh, which can be uh, complemented by the organized data where we uh, track, uh, follow up, and try to get more data. So once we get a report, uh, uh, so there are a series of steps that happen. We pick up the events, we assess whether it's serious or not, whether it's expected, and then give a causality assessment. So this is, uh, I'll take you through some examples. Uh, so I thought I'll uh, explain these concepts via through an example so that it is uh, more clear to you. So now this is an example of a 21-year-old uh, male subject uh, had difficulty in breathing and urticaria 20 minutes after the administration of vaccine A. So he was taken to a healthcare facility, low BP, high pulse rate. So he was diagnosed with anaphylactic reaction and given epinephrine. So his condition improved. So what would be the adverse event? So if you want, you can... Uh, uh, put up in the chat box, like if you want, like what would be the adverse event in this case? Uh -huh. and, uh... Anyway, we'll, uh, uh, this one. so we heard, uh, we, we take anaphylactic reaction, so we know the diagnosis, the symptoms, all the symptoms of, um, have been subsumed under the anaphylactic reaction. So we take this as the event, adverse event for this case, and uh, we move on, move on to the next uh, thing. So, so while we, pick, uh, we are taking events, we have a dictionary in place, uh, some of you have been knowing, Medra. So this uh, events, whatever is reported, we match it to the events there in Medra. So that uh, uh, I can show you the, this one. So this is how a Medra uh, dictionary is arranged. So we have nearly, and if you see the LLT low level term, nearly 80,000 plus terms. So whatever is reported is matched to the nearest possible LLT so that it is appropriately organized. And there are uh, nearly 27 uh, system organ classes. So, so like gastrointestinal system, uh, uh, you know, the central nervous system, the cardiovascular system the digest, uh, the, uh, uh, the gastrointestinal system and uh, multiple systems. So so once we get individual reports, it is arranged in a proper uh, systematic way, then we can uh, understand the comments. So what system is getting more involved? Uh, where is the uh, safety profile of the drug? So that's how we need to know Metra. Metra is available online. Uh, you can see like, how, how it is done. And then coming to the seriousness. So again, the same case, uh, so just to uh, help you familiarize with the whole uh, process. So uh, what happens after submission? You know, that, like many people don't know what happens. So I thought I'll take you through this. So in this case, again, uh, would you keep it serious or non-serious? So considering that anaphylactic reaction is a serious event, uh, we have to, uh, it's potentially life threatening so we, we keep it serious. So again, there are a, a certain uh, criteria for us to help us in assessment of the seriousness. So if it is fatal, if it is life-threatening, hospitalization, disability, and congenital anomalies, then uh, invariably has to be serious. And also we can use medical judgment and if there is a fracture and surgeries and uh, we can keep it serious. Uh, other is um, non-serious. So why is seriousness important? Because uh, the timelines. Serious cases goes within 15 days to the authorities, the, regulatory authorities uh, who is monitoring, and then uh, non-serious cases within 30, 30 days. So serious within 15, non-serious within 30 days. Next, coming to the expectedness. So now, now we have taken this reaction, adverse anaphylactic reaction. So we, uh, we next, next um, find out whether it's expected or not. So we have these control documents, uh, which is available for each vaccine, each product separately. Uh, so for during clinical trials, we see the IV document, and uh, uh, after uh, well, once it's in the market, post marketing phase, we see the SMPC, CCDS, other documents. So to see to know, uh, so if anaphylactic reaction has previously occurred, so it will be expected. Uh, uh, it will be in there in the document, and it's expected. Otherwise, it is like unexpected. So unexpected events uh, have a more uh, significant pharmacovigilance wise, which needs some um, evaluation.
causality assessment. Uh, so finally, after uh, 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 working through the case, the final step is the causality, related, not related. So how do we assess it with a temporal association? So, uh, so the time relationship. So we can observe this. Uh, some events happen after six months, seven months. So obviously there is no temporal association. So we need to take that into account. So here, uh, immediately within 20 minutes, this, uh, it has happened. Exclusion. If there is any other factor in the case which could have contributed to the adverse event, is the exclusion. So if that is the case, then it is not associated to the uh, vaccine and it is because of the other factors which is there in the case. So that is exclusion. Uh, novelty is an expectedness. So it has it uh, occurred before with the drug. So if it has occurred, so there's a high chance. If it's an expected event, then yeah. So so this causality tends to be related. But um, uh, if it is happening for the first time, we don't, we don't know whether it's like related or not related. But if it has happened before, then a high chance of uh, telling it is to be related. And then the scientific plausibility. So based on that vaccine, you know, like it can cause an anaphylactic reaction. So the biological plausibility based on our uh, medical assessment, we can say whether it's related or not related. So in the same case, again, um, uh, same, uh, what would you keep? We can either keep related or not related. For all practical purposes, I know the UMC has, uh, WHO has this uh, multiple uh, uh, causality scales, but for uh, conventionally we keep it related, not related, or not accessible. So here, considering the acute temporal association and the scientific plausibility that a uh, uh, that uh, an anaphylactic reaction could occur with the vaccine, so we can keep it as related. So that was how each case, once it is uh, submitted uh, by uh, either spontaneously or uh, through. Uh, clinical trials and other organized way, we assess a case, uh, individual case safety reporting, and then we submit it to the authorities, FDA, EMA, and other respective country authorities uh, from across the world. So that that is uh, about the thing. Now, now coming to challenges uh, in causality assessment, especially with vaccines. See, vaccines sometimes, you know, DPT uh, and uh, uh, no, MMR and all uh, several vaccines are given together, so we don't know which vaccine has actually caused which event. So, so that's the challenge. So the challenge. So normally in other medicines, and all it's given over a period of time, and then an adverse event happens, and we stop the drug, and then the adverse event recovers. So that the challenge and the challenge and all is not possible in a vaccine because it's just given like most of the times one dose. Uh, there's no series of uh, doses as in like daily. So the challenge usually is not relevant. Uh, like uh, minimum exposure with a vaccine and the possibility of coincidentally even especially with mass vaccination programs now we have this covid vaccine uh, the huge pop uh, like population is uh, you know uh, vaccinated and then uh, with or without the vaccination there will be some events which are happening so because of the vaccination uh, you know the coincidental events are like tend to get uh, highlighted and then the possibility of immunization error because of the uh, inadequate storage, handling, and all. So these are some of the challenges that happen uh, for causality assessment. So that's why we also need to do aggregate reports, uh, uh, see cluster of cases, and uh, uh, assessment, which I'll uh, come to. So some of you might be asking me, why, why do we need to do after you know, the vaccine is introduced into the market? Why can't we do it before itself during the clinical trial? Phase itself, uh, find out all the safety profile of the drug, and you know, bring only safe vaccines. True, we do we do pharmacovigilance during clinical trial also, uh, but the challenge here is, as you can see here, uh, phase three, even the phase three trial, ten thousand or maybe twenty thousand. This is an approximate uh, number. So uh, we are and, and usually we take healthy volunteers, and you know the the sample size at the most can be twenty twenty five thousand. So which may not be uh, sufficient for us to detect serious, I mean, like, uh, the rare adverse events. It may not be possible uh, during the clinical trials. So in spite of our pharmacovigilance activities during clinical trials, we still have to continue it. Even after the after the phase three, the drug is entering, and the vaccine is entering into the market. So even that continues even after that. So this is the, uh, see, uh, as you can see, the very rare, Adverse drug. So this is the frequency of adverse drug reactions. Uh, 
uh, address events sorry address events so very rare means if it is like just one person one subject in 10000 you know 10000 that's like a huge uh, uh, number uh, so you know we might not be able to detect during um, our clinical trial so we have to uh, do the post marketing surveillance and also one more point that we can see here is even though it's very rare like just one in 10000 it is still significant for pharma, vaccine pharmacovigilance because uh, vaccines like the you know, covid vaccine is given for close together so even a, a very rare adverse event which happens just one in 10000 uh, uh, subjects is attains higher high significance levels because of the uh, you know because of this mass vaccination programs so that's why vigilance is important for vaccines so uh, what are the factors contributing to the safety profile of a vaccine uh, so there are certain vaccine intrinsic factors and there are certain host factors so the type of vaccine uh, or live attenuated vaccines uh, have a certain safety profile compared to the inactivated vaccines so now uh, vaccines I, 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 as i told you it's a biological product so what happens is we need a, a stabilizer which are given to it and because the intent is to induce an immune response in the subject so there are some sometimes adjuvants which are given along with the vaccine uh, to improve the immunogenicity and then uh, sometimes viruses are grown in culture cell cultures and to prevent bacterial growth antibiotics are added so there may be a trace amount of antibiotic in the vaccine so some of them might be uh, uh, sensitive to the antibiotics preservatives are added so the, to into the cell life so vaccine Uh, there may be adverse reaction not necessarily only to the vaccine but also to the associated components uh, which are these so we need to take that into factor to via both during drug development vaccine development and uh, uh, afterwards so the batch of a vaccine season certain times uh, there may be a problem only with a certain batch because of that manufacturing process that happens uh, to that particular batch and certain that time we probably have to do a withdrawal of that batch so that that's the i mean like the uh and the rationale of asking for the batch number in that uh, form the case record form and uh, this uh, the uh, factors like the route of administration the schedule of uh, vaccine host factors again age groups so the immune system uh, de- uh, differs from uh, as the age uh, uh, de- de- depending on the age so that plays a role in uh, the safety profile and the uh, adverse effect pregnancy again live attenuated vaccines there's a there's a chance of you know the fetus getting the infection it's a chance so <coughs> immunocompromised people again uh, so they may be sensitive to the infection to the vaccine and also there may be a chance that they do not develop sufficient immune response so so the immunocompromised people have a separate uh, benefit risk curve profile altogether for vaccines so uh, certain uh, concepts in uh, uh, we have submitted uh, we have submitted uh, reports now we have re- reported the uh, ics has to the regulatory authorities what happens after that signals signals you know signal management so that is also a, a component of uh, pharmacovigilance a safety observation so any information that we get that is different from what we expect is a safety observation so it can be quantitatively or qualitatively quantitatively again so we get uh, the frequency of one particular adverse reaction is increasing you know uh, so that is statistically so quantitatively uh, by using those tools and all this is called sdr signals of disproportionate reporting so uh, frequency of one particular adverse event uh, increasing compared to before so uh, so there's a, there are uh, methods for it and qualitative safety observations are in each case like a suzar suzar is a serious event Uh, we went through an unexpected event uh, and then also suspected as in related so that's the suza and then we also have a certain designated events like adverse events of special interest uh, so so those icsr uh, undergo special um, follow up and uh, uh, interest and then there are certain risk management topics and uh, each case no? and then in certain uh, if you get reports from a particular population we taken that into for uh, signal study So next it becomes a signal uh, when a new uh, potentially causal association or a new aspect of a known association so that is the definition of a signal which you know because of between intervention and events which justifies a very fact reaction so these are all uh, pharmacovigilance terms definitions 
uh, are from the EMEA uh, side. So, so from a signal, from a safety observation, uh, uh, you know, if it classifies the SNP criteria, it becomes a signal. Like there's uh, the strength of the association, is there the newness of the event, clinical importance, and then potential for prevention. So that's the criteria for carry, uh, satisfies. Uh, it is a uh, of an ICS uh, satisfies. It becomes a signal, and then even um, uh, that uh, signals of disproportionate reporting. If we do a medical judgment, uh, and then we can uh, classify it as a signal. From aggregate reports, we get signals. So these are like uh, refined activities, like. Uh, so once the signal is confirmed, it becomes a safety issue. So we need to take some action for it. So, so what are the actions? So, uh, so we have every market authorization holders will have a risk management plan uh, in place. So this is the whole plan of which the most important one is the risk minimization measures. So one of the most uh, important risk minimization, minimization measure is uh, communication. So communicate all stakeholders, uh, keep it transparent. So that is one. And then there's a communication to the healthcare providers, healthcare workers, uh, and um, other risk minimization measures are like certain if there is a problem, withdrawal. If there's a problem with a particular batch, uh, we withdraw, withdraw the batch. And uh, so that is uh, possible. And then um, also, uh, finally, if it is, uh, completely uh, is not working, then we completely withdraw the uh, vaccine and the drug from the market. So these are, uh, so the whole system, you know, the pharmacovigilance system has a lot of well orchestrated uh, uh, ICSRs, signal management, risk management, uh, periodic safety update reports, uh, PEBRAs, periodic benefit risk evaluations, and audits and inspections, which happens. So the ultimate uh, goal, as we told, is to improve the benefit uh, for the subject as well as for the you know community uh, and then uh, reduce the risks so that is the whole objective so so if there is something that you want to uh, like a take home message like uh, for a successful vaccination program we need va vaccine pharmacovigilance uh, and uh, we need to report uh, at those events you know, for a good pharma good vaccine pharmacovigilance system So these are my uh, references. Most of it commonly available. Uh, EMA site, uh, CDSO guidelines, uh, Uppsala monitoring center, so much. I can probably share this later. Like, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir, for that informative session. Um, we will now open the floor for discussion. If there are any doubts, any queries, Please unmute or put them in the chat box. Yeah, please. Yeah, questions, questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rowan. Um, it seems like there are no questions as of now. So we shall proceed to the third speaker of the day. I would like to welcome Dr. Deepak T.S., Senior Manager of Clinical Affairs at Healthium MedTech Private Limited, who will be giving us an insight on careers in pharmacovigilance. I request Dr. Nathpati B. P. Bhatt, Associate Professor, Department of Pharmacology, Yanapoya Medical College, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Ms. Sananya. Hope I am audible to all of you. Uh, good afternoon, one and all. 
It's indeed my pleasure to introduce the speaker for the next session, Dr. Deepak T.S., who is my junior postgraduate colleague at MMC, Mysore Medical College and Research Institute at Mysore. Dr. Deepak T.S. completed his MBBS from Vijayanagara Institute of Medical Sciences, Ballari, and MD Pharmacology from Mysore Medical College and Research Institute, Mysore. Then he further pursued a DNB Pharmacology and also PG Diploma in Health and Hospital Management as well as certificate course in epidemiology and biostatistics. Coming to his work experience, uh, Dr. Deepak has uh, worked as a senior pharmacovigilance physician in Kuntal's Bangalore, and he worked as a zonal medical advisor, metabolics in Johnson & Johnson, as well as a medical advisor in the same company, that is Johnson & Johnson, as an infectious disease and vaccine in, the field, in that field. And currently he is working at uh, Healthium MedTech Private Limited as senior manager clinical affairs from past two years. So Dr. Deepak has got many papers and posters. He has presented at various conferences. He has uh, attended many workshops and conferences. He has conducted many workshops and contributed in that field. He has many publications, awards and honors under his credit. So we have the right person to deliver the talk on careers in pharmacovigilance. On behalf of Department of Pharmacology, I thank you personally as well for agreeing in spite of your busy schedule. Over to you, Dr. Deepak. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Napati Bhatt, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Deepak. So I'll, I'll just share my screen. Uh, uh, but sir, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, no, no, not it's visible. Yes, yes, yes. Sir, yes. It's visible. Yes, it's visible. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, and outside, I'd like to thank the organizers and uh, Dr. Nagpati Bhatt, sir, for uh, providing this opportunity. Um, so uh, next next 20 23 to 24 minutes i'll be um, uh, just talking about careers in pharmacovigilance myself dr deepak i think uh, sir uh, sir has been generous, generous enough to give a very elaborate introduction about myself i'll just skip that part so i'll uh, before i start the actual topic i'll just uh, uh, give a little bit background maybe uh, take a step back from pharmacovigilance or meteorovigilance or immovigilance and like let's discuss what is vigilance so see the colloquial definition of vigilance the action or state of keeping careful watch for possible danger or difficulties it, it, it's vigilance is just being wakeful or watchful so vigilance as a concept per se is not new to all of us uh, it is an ingrained inherent property for all of us it is there in our genes like you, you can see this like all of you would have done this or experienced this definitely as soon as you see traffic police checking like irrespective of you know that person like you will not be related you will just give him a signal Age police wala kadai. so this is something which uh, vigilance is something which is not very new for uh, all of us so it, it's there it's it, 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 it's almost like uh, all of you know the word innate it's, it's innate enough so like maybe next thing is like how many of you have watched Rade movie not many right like what is the reason? Even I did not watch it. Again, people whom I don't know, like people unknown to me, saved me from it. So this is again a sort of vigilance. Like people have suffered something, and they are are like they are just alerting people who have not suffered that uh, that this is something which has happened, and like they are just telling us don't watch it. So vigilance is something which is definitely being innate with us, doing the same thing with respect to drugs or devices is pharmacovigilance or meteorovigilance respectively. But because the issue at hand is not so trivial, just like a traffic check or like a movie review, it requires a structure as such for it. It requires an authority to control and it requires qualified, intelligent professionals to do it. So that's what the topic of today's is career options in pharmacovigilance. So maybe like basically uh, uh, seeing the trend of events last almost 
10 15 days like almost every nodal center is so active uh, in creating awareness for pharmacovigilance that is actually a very welcome step which has happened in 2021 so why pharmacovigilance does it really matter so this is something which uh, if you ask me like last 6 years i have spent in the industry like what uh, 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 what uh, like was discussed in the introduction to pharmacovigilance like why reporting is in, important why this is important all those things uh, like you are you are seeing from the reporting standpoint but uh, from the industry standpoint like once the reporting is done what all happens and what are the changes which will happen what are the actual changes which will happen at the regulatory level so these are all like very very interesting things and very impactful things so if you if you ask me does it uh, like the department has organized the cme about pharmacovigilance like does pharmacovigilance really matter like take it from me it definitely matters and i'll just uh, take you across like couple of case studies this is something which i'm like very closely involved in uh, so all of you uh, know anti diabetic drugs right like this is something little bit detailed into the subject but don't worry i'm not like talking about the core subject but all of you know anti diabetic drugs uh, all of you know what are sglt2 inhibitors in sglt2 inhibitors canagliflozin is one of the drug in that class so canvas trial is the name of the trial which is conducted for canagliflozin so the first trial uh, for uh, one of the cvot first cvot trial for cvot is cardiovascular outcome trial for canagliflozin was started in the year 2010 so in this when the trial was started few of the patients who were in canagliflozin are at fractures so at the start people start like it's a anti diabetic drug having fractures is nowhere related Uh, to canagliflozin flowing so it was like it just passed off then um, as and when the trial was progressing there was a trend of very much increased number of fractures happening in the canagliflozin arm compared to the placebo arm that's when the actual signal was generated okay canagliflozin an anti diabetic drug a fracture is the signal so signal is something which uh, is unknown event which is happening post in post uh, treatment with a particular drug so the signal was generated so lot of analysis went in lot of pharmacovigilance professionals were put into task millions of pages of data were like totally gone through like what could be the reason they did like bone profiles for all those patients their calcium phosphorus everything was like totally normal and they studied the sglt2 receptors in the bone so sglt there were no sglt2 receptors in the bone which they could have attributed it to so like after so much of work then Uh, they started building the hypothesis what could be the reason then they started analyzing all the fractures what what led to fracture then when they started like majority of the fractures were due to fall okay what could be the reason so we were just uh, looking at fractures maybe we, fracture was the not not the thing which we should have looked at what is the reason for fall okay fall could be due to hypotension like volume depletion okay volume depletion then they got the connect sglt2 inhibitor by the nature of the virtue of its mechanism uh it 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 causes excretion of glucose whenever glucose is excreting it draws water along with that because of that there was volume depletion as soon as volume depletion happens there were like falls and because of falls there were fractures so if you see uh, the signal was identified so uh, there were like 55% increase in the fracture rate with in the canagliflozin arm versus placebo in the first trial so as soon as all the pharmacovigilance professionals worked out and then they conceptualized this theory a basic theory of like volume depletion leading to fall leading to fracture uh, so all the physicians who were involved in the future trials as well as in the clinical practice they started telling all the patients adequate hydration is a must if you are treated with this particular drug careful dose escalation if you have started the patients on 100 mg just don't increase them to 300 just like that escalate the dose very carefully and proper patient counseling to take adequate water maintain adequate hydration not to suddenly wake up from bed like sit down so that the postural hypotension should not happen so these kind of precautions were taken so without any change in the drug you can see the timelines 2010 the trial was started by 2013 55% increase in fracture rate was noted with this drug but two trials were started somewhere 2014 late 2014 15 and in both the trials there was absolutely no increase in the fracture rate between the can canagliflozin treated group versus the placebo group so just with adequate hydration just with following very basic things without making any change in the chemical structure of the drug the side effect or the signal which was generated was totally cleared up so now uh, this entire group this particular activity did not not only help for the drug canagliflozin 
because majority like all the all the glyphosates be it empower depo everything acts by the same mechanism so whenever uh, sorry for the background disturbance whenever whenever our uh, physicians are uh, using this particular drug they started uh, giving this kind of, taking this kind of precautions because of that this entire uh, uh, side effect of fracture risk has been taken care of and majority like it has infected millions of patients so the physicians who have worked for this particular hypothesis and then how uh, the physicians were uh, like educated to follow this particular thing whenever they are using sgt2 inhibitors has infected millions millions of patients not only can i get flows in patients the entire uh, in in the diabetes space and all those patients on this therapy with with this particular things they are like totally totally uh, benefited because of pharmacovigilance at the actual uh, label level like at the actual warnings precautions level maybe i'll just take a small example of a, a particular device so suture material is a device so normally what happens is if you see any suture material the thread should be to the needle so that particular process is called as swaging so normally what happens is a suture thread will be taken it will be uh, inserted into the bore of the uh, needle and when the when it is inserted it will be uh, just crimp crimp will be uh, crushing it so that the needle will hold the thread so that becomes a suture material a packed suture material so this is a normal crimping is a normal process followed for all sutures it works fine but there were like which still sutures there were like continuous complaints like off and on off and on so when all these complaints were collected together and an analysis was done so the only complaint with this particular suture was like it boiled down to that particular swaging point so that's when uh, it was realized okay maybe the for normal crimping process which is followed for all sutures is not suitable for uh this particular steel suture so instead of like crushing the uh, needle to attach the suture uh, a soldering mechanism was introduced since then the entire uh, uh, like whatever complaints were there that was solved like it's such simple solutions like either uh, if you see the canagliflozin in example like it causes volume depletion then fall then fracture or a soldering for a needle it looks very 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 simple at this point of time but when you when you see the drug was introduced the drug was implemented it was going through clinical trials at that point of time people were clueless they would have it's it's a very promising therapy it's in the middle of the trials and such a signal which is like not related no one with no one are able to like boil down to any hypothesis so that's when the actual pharmacovigilance comes down like all the analysis all the all the all the uh, causal assessment like everything whatever was discussed regarding the causality assessment proper history taking the additional drugs concomitant medications everything will be so much useful useful at that point of time like these two examples may be a little bit off for you but uh, this is something which i think uh, the, the dr robin also covered in very much detail so you can you can see like all of you have seen like when an entire world was waiting for vaccine suddenly one day like one adverse event one serious adverse event happened nasrajnika passed their vaccine trial So immediately the next day, India uh, passed their COVID-shielded uh, vaccine trials. The same thing with Johnson and Johnson. So immediately it it, it stopped the entire trial. Sixty thousand patient clinical trial was put on hold, uh, uh, and they were just awaiting for the data and safety monitoring board report to analyze that adverse event and give a finding. So this is this is something which uh, is the impact uh, of. Uh, because at that point of time gnj being such a big company none of the company officials were allowed to speak like it, it's the entire focus was on the data and safety monitoring board so th this is the importance of pharmacovigilance so careers in pharmacovigilance i'll just go on to the actual topic maybe i've just uh, spent uh, a little bit more time on setting the context but that was more important because the major part of uh, yeah, the careers in pharmacovigilance will be explained uh, by by what we have like what case studies we have just discussed so mainly careers in pharmacovigilance other than uh, the medical college because you are the audience is from medical college you know what happens with respect to pharmacovigilance what is the role of pharmacovigilance in medical colleges and you are you are the best person to explain that so i am not i have skipped that part i have just taken what are the careers in pharmacovigilance with respect to cros regulatory authorities and manufacturers i just uh, so all these three places there are opportunities for pharmacovigilance uh, physicians pharmacovigilance professionals so again they go by various designations so this i have just catered it if at all you are a physician if you are a mbbs md uh, physician or surgeons there are surgeons who are uh, in pharmacovigilance profile so uh, either of them like the designations go by this like more or less 
uh, again, each company has got a different designations, but um, the roles and responsibilities will be slightly overlapping between them. Be it a pharmacovigilance physician, few companies call it as medical safety advisor, few companies call it as safety lead, expert safety physician, signal detection physician, safety surveillance specialist, pharmacovigilance specialist, be it a medical reviewer or a PB specialist. So these are the various different designations which are uh, there uh, as uh, for, for uh, physicians who, who want to opt for pharmacovigilance as their career. So what, what are the careers and roles? Like if you are working in a CRO, what will you be actually doing? Dr. Rovin has like shown like beautiful case reports on like how do you assess the seriousness, how do you assess the causality, whether it's a labeled event, expected, unexpected. So basically, uh, what will be done is if a clinical trial, so CROs in the sense, what happens when the manufacturers uh, will be manufacturers or uh, the marketing authorization holders, the companies, be it any company, any large company, if you can take it. Uh, PV pharmacovigilance is slightly a difficult function uh, to manage. So what they do is entirely they outsource the pharmacovigilance function uh, to external parties. One difficult to manage. Second, they want to be impartial because at the end of the day, if you're working for a company, you might be partial, whatever adverse events are there in reporting. So they, they usually outsource it to a neutral party and the, the CROs take that responsibility. So what do they actually do? Any clinical trials are happening, any adverse event, just like what happened for adverse event, those kind of things, the entire review of, there will be different, different life science graduates who will be doing the case processing and then bringing up the case putting in all the information about the case and then the medical professionals will be actually reviewing the case and updating the causality assessment, whether this particular event which has happened is related to the drug. To give you an example, maybe a patient has taken paracetamol today morning and uh, afternoon he went for a uh, normal CT scan and he was diagnosed with cancer. So what will be the causality assessment? One dose of paracetamol, can it cause cancer? It, it's very simple. There is no causal association. No, no drug can cause cancer in six hours. Similarly, maybe a patient is taking on some anti rheumatoid drug for last three years and now he has developed kidney failure. And he has not on any other treatment, he was perfectly fine before starting the drug. So then the causality assessment points towards that. It's, it's not certain that that has caused, but this is something uh, again, as uh, Madam showed, various scales, like various uh, parameters are there uh, to assess. But this is what will be actually done by a pharmacovigilance professional. ICSR, ICSR is individual case safety reports for products which are already in the market, which are already approved. So if there is any safety event which needs to be, which is there, if a serious safety event is there, so that needs to be assessed. Medical review needs to be done for that. Literature area, there will be numerous publications which are happening worldwide. If there are any adverse drug reactions captured within that literature, that needs to be taken out, pulled out, analyzed, and then reported to the various regulatory authorities as and when it is applicable. Legal cases, there will be various legal, I think all of you know, like, definitely you would be watching so many shows. I mean, uh, in India, it is still in the budding stage, but in developed countries like US and all, for left, right, and like anything happens to the patient, they'll be filing cases against the doctors as well as for the, as well as against the pharma companies. So the causality assessment needs to be done by an independent pharmacovigilance physician for all these legal cases. Again, all these small, small reports, like individual reports, maybe one from Yanapoya, one from JSS, Mysore, one from Kanpur, one from uh, Assam, all these reports, if at all they are happening one, one, like you might think, okay, what happens? Like one, one adverse event in this particular issue, nothing will happen. But when all these reports are collected, aggregate, when, when they collect and do a aggregate reporting, that's when they can actually identify a signal, just like the one I, oh, I showed regarding the fractures, like various, uh, the trial was happening somewhere around 250 to 300 sites across the world. So each site might have shown one one fracture, but when they started doing the aggregate reporting of all those events, that's when the signal was generated. So whenever a signal is generated, it needs to be detected and it needs to be managed. Managed again in the terms of whether it is something which cannot be done, it is an identified side effect, then put it in the warning sections or put it in the label, put a black box warning that if you want to have the benefit of having the drug, this side effect is something which is unavoidable. According to the labeling updates, like as and when you buy some tablets or uh, any medicines, you'll be having a big label inside, the product inside, product brochure. So that's where you will be updating the label with all these kind of things, like you update the intended use. Trend reporting, is the trend decreasing? Is the trend of adverse events something which is uh, increasing trend, decreasing trend, or is it seen in particular group of particular subgroup of patients with comorbidities or concomitant medications? Identifying the risks and management. So basically, if at all there is a particular risk, like how to manage that 
particular risk? Is it something which the risk benefit ratio is favorable to the drug or device or is it otherwise? And periodic safety update reports. So these are all regulatory requirements. So you need to collect all the adverse events of that particular drug within that period of one year and then you need to be submitting to the regulatory authorities. Again, different time frames, be it six months, one year, depending on what regulatory authority says. So these are all the things, roles and responsibilities which the manufacturers can outsource to CROs or the manufacturer can, like these are all the various CROs like IQVR, Accenture, Cognizant, TCS, like there are multiple, there are around 100 CROs who are doing pharmacovigilance work where they hire people, uh, all life science graduates, including doctors, uh, because a medical review should be done by doctors, but other case processing, other life science graduates, pharmacy graduates will be uh, like used for, like they'll be employed for uh, reviewing of the case because a lot of work needs to be done uh, for uh, to report one case. So this is something which is at the industry level, like multiple CROs are there. Like all these roles, what I showed with respect to CROs can also be done by their, by their own manufacturers itself, like instead of outsourcing. Some people say like we'll manage it ourselves. So, so all those responsibilities can be done by manufacturers. Plus, in addition to that, manufacturers also have uh, customer interactions like uh, interacting with the surgeons, if, if they have faced some adverse events, interacting with them. Sales team will be there, like all, all pharma companies have sales team and sensitizing them for ADR reporting and handling. Updating of the product labeling, safety data sheet, investigators brochure, like investigators brochure is a document which goes along with the clinical trial document. So like if, if any signal is identified, so brochure needs to be updated. All the centers which are participating in the clinical trial needs to be updated. Similarly, if a product which is already launched has got a new safety finding, then all the labeling needs to be updated. Decide, change, optimize the indication of the product, warnings of the product. Because like, just because one of the drugs um, was causing increased renal failure uh, in patients uh, who already had renal failure. So the indication was changed to uh, use the drug only in patients with EGFR, uh, glomerular filtration rate, more than 60. If it is less than 60, don't use the drug. So this is of the indication stage. Warnings I showed, a big warning will be there. There is a risk of fracture associated with this particular drug. Precautions, you need to... If you're taking this drug, you need to maintain proper hydration, you need to... Uh, so these kind of precautions can be added to the label. Like whatever you see, uh, if you go to any of... Uh, take out any tablet sheet, like you'll see a big sheet. Whatever is there in the sheet is the outcome of years and years of pharmacovigilance which has happened. So again, uh, other responsibility of pharmacovigilance team in the... Uh, along with the... Working along with the manufacturers are interact with the manufacturing and quality team to continuously update what is the trend of ADRs and regularly review the risk benefit analysis. And if at all there is a particular risk, then to conduct clinical studies to assess what is the residual risk, particular to that particular residual risk, what is the uh, like impact of that residual risk on the safety profile of the drug. Data and safety review board. I showed you in the clinical trial, the entire uh, the JNJ vaccine study was shut awaiting the drug and data and safety monitoring board report. So again, uh, indications, warnings, precautions, as I mentioned, and regulatory representation. So all these things needs to be done. And while doing, uh, they need to interact with the regulators, be it DCGA or USFDA, any of the regulators. That regulatory representation is also a physician's responsibility. This is what uh, we, we do, like we, we interact with uh, DCGA. If there is any safety finding which has been identified, we write to the DCGA. They have a committee, uh, which I'll see in the, uh, I'll just show in the next slide. So they actually uh, interact with the industry to understand whether the drug should stay in the market or it should be taken off. So th these are the various companies which are there. Like if you see JJ, they out they have outsourced their uh, PV. Like there are companies like Novartis, where they are their Inos PV. So every responsibility is done by uh, them uh, themselves. Like different companies have different approach. These are all the MNCs which I am showing. Now uh, the, the PV was just an option before, but now it's like it's a mandatory function for all manufacturers, be it MNCs, women's is to 100%, but even Indian manufacturers now, they are mandated to have a PV uh, department. And accordingly, there are thousands of Indian manufacturers, be it medical devices or pharmaceuticals, where uh, they they are setting up or already half of them have set up and they are setting up in future years, couple of years, everyone will be equipped with a PV department to PV or MV department, depending on if it is uh, drugs or devices to manage their adverse events. So what are the careers and roles in the regulatory authorities? At the regulatory level, be it CDSO, uh, CDSO is our regulatory authority, Indian, SFDA is China's, TGA is Australian authority, MHRA is UK, and PMDA is Japan. 
US FDA. So any of these regulatory authorities you take it, there is a requirement of pharmacovigilance position. Maybe uh, now I think there are there are a group of people who are directly hired by CDSU at this point of time. They were not there before, like a couple of years before. Now they have actually directly hired physicians uh, uh, among their panel. Because this is something which is highly intellectual work which will be going on and it requires actual physicians with clinical experience uh, to take uh, very, very valid decisions. Uh, and I think Medra was shown by Dr. Rovin. So coding regulations for area. This is something again, a very highly regulated yearly twice the entire coding of um, uh, adverse, re adverse reactions will be updated. So this is also it requires a physicians with clinical experience. PV regulations and guidelines, devising these guidelines like we were talking about all those adverse sheets now a new sheet has come for COVID. So all these guidelines needs to be devised as and when, depending on the time, as in the COVID came, a new sheet was identified. So all this work requires people behind it, brains behind it. That is what uh, is the responsibility of PV professionals. And whatever uh, ADRs you have submitted, either through medical colleges or the industry is submitting, someone should, the regulatory should review it and take decisions, whether to keep the drug in the market or take it out or like assess the risk benefit profile of the drug, assess what, what should be the label revisions, whether to add it as a warning, black box, all these regulatory decisions to take regulatory decisions, there are there is a requirement for qualified professionals. Uh, so these are the different roles uh, which are there in regulatory authorities. So uh, maybe I'll just move on to what are the advantages of uh, roles uh, in um, careers in pharmacovigilance. So it's, it's a sort of fixed working hours. Sometimes there will be a little bit of spillover here and there, but like fixed working hours, this is an advantage. Work-life balance is, uh, it's, it's pretty uh, definitely because uh, at least uh, I, I, I know my clinical colleagues, work-life balance is definitely a uh, fair. Work from home is an option. Uh, that too with COVID, like they have adopted, few of the companies have closed down their offices and they have like adopted like complete work from home. Uh, no patient interaction, uh, but still, uh, if you see the larger picture, uh, I just showed you, I told you the canal diffusion, it, you can impact a lot of patients. It's not that you are creating a difference. You can impact a lot of patients. Again, if you just see the larger picture, if you just see, okay, I'm sitting in front of the computer, analyzing some reports, what am I doing? If you are just seeing that very, very small, uh, very uh, narrow-minded view, then it does not, um, uh, it, it looks like you're not impacting anything. But uh, if you see the larger picture, definitely you can impact a lot of patients. It's an impactful role of the, in the organization, reliance on importance in the organization. Majority of the MNCs, uh, the, and all the functions will be reporting to the CEO, like reporting to the business heads. But this is PV is one function directly will be reporting to the CEO because that is one function which does not want any hindrance from the manufacturing. Because as soon as you tell, okay, these are the complaints which are coming, the manufacturing might come and uh, they want to suppress, no, our products, what we are manufactured is good. So that is where uh, it's a very independent function in majority of the uh, uh, MNCs where uh, there is very, very reliance on importance on the organization. So these are the advantages. Disadvantages uh, are need to actually work. Uh, this is something which uh, looks like funny, but uh, you need to use your brains. If you are there, uh, need to actually work. Work is highly time bound. Uh, because uh, as both uh, uh, the speakers were talking about serious adverse events should be having timelines, you need to report if in a clinical trial, you need to report within 24 hours, like whatever you are doing, like we are currently running, if you're running a clinical trial, wherever you are, if you are the medical monitor for that, as soon as the adverse event happens, serious adverse event happens, within 24 hours, the report should go to DCGI. Uh, at that time, it will be a little bit stressful, may become monotonous because this is something like after five, six years, like I'm doing the same reporting, uh, same adverse event comes in my laptop, I'll review it and report it. Uh, so this is something uh, I have heard people saying, yes, it becomes monotonous, no grandeur, like unlike, because some patients, uh, some, some surgeons, some physicians say like, they feel that grandeur when patients are surrounded by them, like they will be waiting for them. Uh, so that kind of grandeur is not associated with this particular uh, thing. So they, both the things, like if you, if you, if at all you feel that, enjoy that then this is not there like if you don't like patient interaction then that you can consider it as an advantage feeling of not creating an impact like if you're not definitely seeing the larger picture this feeling will always be there uh, okay i'm not doing anything so th these are all the advantages disadvantages which will be there uh, like maybe because i'm talking about careers like salary is one part i think uh, the, we uh, need to touch like i'm not talking in uh, taking a number but it's definitely competitive. I am in the industry for the last six years. It is definitely at any point of time, not less 
compared to any of the clinical fields any any of the uh, any of the people who are earning uh, after their mbbs or after their any of these specializations so that is uh, one thing for sure again you should not be comparing to a clinician who is working 24 hours doing night duties every day not for that like for a 8 hours job if you are a pharmacovigilance physician versus any other any other specialty uh, the salary is 100% competitive not less than any other field so salary is not at all a problem again the larger picture uh, if you if you see it it's a impactful job with a competitive salary uh, what is the future of pharmacovigilance uh, regulatory authorities are becoming more and more and more stringent previously the regulations were applicable only for drugs now the entire regulations which were applicable for drugs have become made of uh, same regulations have become uh, uh, like totally applicable for devices maybe another 3 4 years down the line i'll i'll definitely be seeing the same pharmacovigilance program what cmes are happening same metro vigilance program the same emphasis will be there because india is little bit slow to catch up so this is something which will be there chemo vigilance is again uh, all the blood and blood products adr related to that all these programs will be definitely effective because regulatory authorities are leaving no stone like whatever is there see whenever we have meetings with the regulatory authorities what they say is, see whatever you do it is it like it is fine safety is one issue there is absolutely no compromise so this is something which uh, regulatory authorities are very 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 uh, stringent and regulatory authorities also communicate to each other us fda communicates to cdso cdso communicates to, communicates to eme so this is a, again these are all the places where actually pharmacovigilance uh, individual professionals are actually required so the role is going to increase with respect to consumers more and more consumption of drugs is increasing year on year so there is no doubt about it manufacturers everyone are vying for a blockbuster like each manufacturer is fighting uh, for for their next blockbuster drugs so definitely they are not going to stop they are going to manufacture invent new new drugs repurpose drugs so all the three friends beat the regulatory friend definitely more stringent uh, consumers more drug manufacturers why consumers more drugs like increasing poor lifestyle chances like the kind of fast food the kind of lack of exercise all these poor lifestyle choices will definitely mean more diseases more diseases mean more drugs more drugs means more adr so i'll leave it to you like what is the future of pharmacovigilance so this is in brief this is this was my last slide uh, i hope i have uh, i have not seen the time but i hope i have completed it in with the designated time so thank you thank you everyone uh, uh, any any questions uh, please feel free to I'll, i'll just go to the comment section you can comment or you can just unmute yourself and you can you can let me know any Thank any you, question sir for uh, the interesting session uh, there was one question we have received directed to you um are there any certificate courses on pharmacovigilance which we can pursue as students thanks thanks ananya for the question uh, see basically frankly speaking there are uh, various uh, certificate courses which are available but what is the intent of doing uh, that should be if at all your intent is to do that program and uh, get, do that course and get a job uh, does not help uh, so if at all your uh, intent is to understand about the knowledge like there is sufficient information which was presented by our uh, uh, like by our speakers today and like that is there but uh, again at any point of time if you want to do a course uh, uh, like it should you should not be stopping you should go and do it there are multiple courses available for form courses but you just need to see what is the reason you want to do it you just want it as a tick mark activity to put it in your cv not useful uh, it does not matter Uh, but if you want to learn from that course definitely you should go ahead and do it because uh, for you to get a pharmacovigilance job that is not something which will be important your clinical skills your knowledge definitely a basic mbbs degree and then maybe a md in any of the specialties so it's it's not related to a pharmacovigilance uh, professionals are not limited to md pharmacology or any of the pre or para clinical fields i have my colleagues who are surgeons psychiatrists ent specialists obg specialists uh, who are working for pharmacovigilance all this clinical experience uh, will be required 
to assess uh, various signals so all the all the speciality people are involved in uh, different for various i've shown you the advantages and disadvantages each individual should be having their own um, uh, perspective about life and and their work so uh, there are people from all specialities in working for pharmacovigilance so so the, the so the, to the question uh, are there any there are many courses you should you do it not required unless it's only purely for knowledge purpose not for any other any other reasons you should not be doing it thank you sir thank you um, thank you ananya dr rovin there was a question directed to you yeah um sir there was a question asking about opportunities post mbbs to get into the pharmacovigilance sector specifically under vaccinations uh, uh yeah see um see what happens is um so there are many uh, multinational companies uh, uh pharmaceutical companies and uh, biotech companies uh also some of them are biopharmaceutical companies so uh, vaccines strictly come under these biotech companies uh so you after mbbs you can uh, approach the uh, bio by bio, other uh, biotech companies or the biopharmaceutical companies and uh, yeah there are plenty of career uh, opportunities for uh, vaccine uh, vigilance uh, so if you see again uh, while jo joining the company you can um, you will be taken in as a pharmacovigilance physician and then they'll have various uh, therapeutic areas uh, like vaccine will be one of the areas so which you can uh, if you're interested in that you can uh, uh, apply for uh, vaccine specifically and like uh, other areas are like uh, uh, like uh, you know, dermatology or the metabolics uh, cns so you can choose if you want for vaccine like uh, so the, uh, you can uh, uh, see which are the manufacturing companies of vaccines and apply and uh, choose choose vaccines in the pharmacovigilance sector yeah i think i i'll just add on to what uh, uh, dr rovin said don't 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 go for a job after your mbbs i think you should uh, because in the even in the industry majority of the mncs there is a rule at least there should be a md uh, or if a post mbbs if there is significant number of years of clinical experience then only they will be hiring uh, the career path will become difficult by chance if you get a job after mbbs career path will not be very smooth uh, as compared to uh, after you have joined your post md or lot of years of clinical experience thank you dr rovin dr deepak um dr swati there were a couple of questions directed yeah. to you yeah um ma'am there was a question about expected adrs like diarrhea yeah. or vomiting should yeah. we be reporting them as well yes because uh, even though we say we know it when we start the reporting culture it's a irrespective of whether it is accepted uh, expected unexpected mild severe please report all because once we get it depending on when they do the causality assessment it goes to the different category everything so it's better you report um there was another question within how many days should we report an adr once we detect it uh yes i think from industry perspective for a regulatory trial yes as deepak said there is a guideline if there is a serious adverse event you have to report within 24 hours usually if it's a mild moderate in the healthcare setup there is nothing specific like a timeline usually it is reported and uh, the from the uh, you know periphery or from the hospital healthcare professional whatever the report is there that is forwarded to the amc and immediately they will forward it to upload it to vg flow there is no time guideline for a uh, you know for regular adrs what is there but for industry clinical trial there is a deadline there is a guideline that you know serious adverse event you have to report within 24 hours to the regulatory authorities ma'am so a follow up question to this yeah. um suppose you interact with a patient and you get yeah. to know that they had faced a particular adverse reaction yeah. uh, for a drug yeah. say maybe 6 months back so that is a very large time gap do you no. still report uh, it at the present date no you don't report it why because uh, that is done and it's managed 
but that will be taken as that person's drug history yes he had a reaction to that drug okay ma'am so it is specifically uh, the pa- at the right. patient level yeah, when but the it patient will be reported as such yeah yeah okay thank you ma'am thank you uh so thank you ladies and gentlemen for attending this cme i would like to invite dr bhageshri assistant professor department of pharmacology yenapoya medical college to propose the vote of thanks good afternoon all i hope i am audible on behalf of Be- department of pharmacology yenapoya medical college i would like to thank the management for the enormous cooperation in organizing this virtual cme i would like to acknowledge today's speakers dr swati acharya dr robin vincent and doc, uh, dr deepak ts for accepting the invitation and sharing their immense knowledge on pharmacovigilance i would also like to thank our hod dr rupa p nayak for the support and guidance she has extended on this occasion i would like to acknowledge ms ananya for being the mc for this virtual cme i would like to express my gr- gratitude to the it department for the technical support last but not the least i take this opportunity to thank all the participants of this virtual cme for attending the sessions and making the event a successful one thank you one and all thank you ma'am um so there has been a feedback link that has been posted in the chat box kindly fill this feedback e certificates will be issued after submission of this feedback form uh, i request all the speakers and the faculty of department of pharmacology to stay back and uh, switch on the camera for a virtual photo thank you all for attending the cme and uh, the other attendees may kindly fill the feedback form and they can log out I request the department staff to switch on their camera. Ananya you can also be part of this Ananya Yes ma'am yeah. Prabhakar sir is uh Dr Rovin Yeah yeah Yes thank you Prabhakar sir is not there but we'll have thank you everyone it was really nice having you all thank you thank you thank, thank you, you for the organizing committee thank you for the organizing committee nice to see you deepak and for all after people. long time likewise likewise mama la 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 just mean that you i'll call yeah okay thank, thank you, you everyone thank you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you